In Anchorage, Alaska, the cold can make homelessness a death sentence. I've been homeless for about 125 days now. You have to be with somebody at all times or you're going to get beat up or raped or robbed. I've been all three. It's um, very cold, very wet, um, very sad. People don't survive, they die. Many women on the margins turn to selling sex to survive. Tara, forced to sell sex as a child, asked us not to show her face on camera. I think that the biggest sex trafficker, the what induces the most people into prostitution is the state and the system. And my caseworker would come and take my money from me. He'd be like, well, you're just gonna use this to buy drugs. The system essentially like removed my entire safety net and then kicked me out into the cold Alaskan winter um, where, you know, the really the only options that I had to survive were prostitution or um, sleeping in a snowbank. Sergeant Kathy Lacey heads the vice squad and oversees all prostitution arrests in Anchorage. I think any time that a woman is selling her body for sex, it should be illegal. It's very degrading and exploitive. And we should quit calling it prostitution. We should call it what it is, which is sexual exploitation. In 2012, Governor Parnell signed a law that redefines any action that promotes prostitution as sex trafficking. For example, owning or managing a home in which prostitution takes place is now trafficking. Of the first four people charged under the new sex trafficking law, three of them were women who were also charged with prostitution. Under the law, they were essentially charged with trafficking themselves. There is a, um, a pretty widespread conflation of prostitution and trafficking right now, and we're seeing it in all of our anti-trafficking initiatives. Really, when you strip them down, turn out to just be anti-prostitution. Uh, initiatives. Kate Mogulescu founded the Trafficking Victims Advocacy Project. As an advocate for sex trafficking victims, she finds most anti-trafficking laws counterproductive. The next breath that comes after that common refrain of we must get traffickers, we must investigate, prosecute, arrest traffickers, is the connection to then arresting people to engage, who are engaging in prostitution. There's this notion that the more people that you come in contact with through the criminal justice system, through an arrest process with police, the more you're going to get at the issue of trafficking. The wider a net you cast, the more people you bring in that somehow, when the smoke clears and the dust settles, you're going to be able to figure out who's a trafficker, who's a victim, and justice will be done. And what we've seen repeatedly is that's not the case. Maxine Dugan is one of the founders of Community United for Safety and Protection, a group fighting to reform Alaska's laws and policies related to selling sex. And here in Alaska, the laws got uh, rewritten so dramatically that uh, we see that even people being busted uh, in ordinary garden variety prostitution arrests are being charged with sex trafficking themselves. Um, we see people who are working together, uh, sharing space, for example, um, workspace, sharing um, customers um, can be charged. So that's really alarming when the um, safety conditions that we set up for ourselves are now being called, you know, sex trafficking. The police are turning around and telling the reporters, and the reporters are turning around and telling the public that somebody is being rescued for, for being a sex traffic victim. The group meets regularly to support each other and to plan actions to change state laws and policies. Thank you guys all for coming. This is our opportunity to get together with Alaskan sex workers and talk about uh, what's not working and how we can affect some change uh, to get us you know, some equal protection under the law and gain some better access to our own labor and our own safe work conditions. One of the main concerns they discuss is abuse from police. Absolutely. Because they're using, I mean, they're it's in a position of power is. and they're mm -hmm. using it to extort sex from us and, and it's, it's their job. Rape. They get paid for it. Yeah, it's but, called rape. Well, it's a form of state-sponsored rape. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. The women also reach out to criminal justice organizations in Alaska. Well, we're a newly formed group. Um, we formed about a year ago. We're a group of sex workers, former sex workers, sex trafficking victims and our allies. 
And so we're addressing, you know, violence um, in our community. And so we've been going around meeting with, you know, groups like yours, um, other NGOs. We actually have been trying to reach out to the community of um, sex trafficking in particular, but in general, um, uh, human trafficking. The group organized a meeting with representatives from the Alaska State Legislature and their aides. We think it's a failed approach. The criminalization of prostitution is a failed approach by means to rescue sex traffic victims. We think that if there are people involved in the industry under exploitive means, they have to be able to <clears throat> have access to equal protection under the law. Some of the people that are, you know, that came today to this meeting have never, you know, spoken to anybody outside of our community about the issues of violence that our community faces. 75% of the people who have been arrested, uh, who have been charged with sex trafficking, um, have allegedly been prostitutes, and 50% uh, of them have been charged with prostitution of themselves in the very same case that they've been charged with sex trafficking. Um, I had um, a police officer that did actually have sex with me, and I would have just been arrested, so I just had to take it. They arrested a lot of customers out in Wasilla, um, and after that, all of the customers, all of the good customers were afraid, and the only customers that were left were, you know, customers that I normally wouldn't see, mm -hmm. um, and so I ended up getting raped during that, the aftermath of that sting, and we think that's what happens on a systemic level. I received these emails and um, it started with um, somebody trying to make an appointment with me. He got very angry with me and proceeded to threaten me, attempt to extort me. Um, and from there, uh, he told me that since I did not pay him the money that he was asking for, that he was going to be waiting for um, me with cuffs and a badge. One of the things that we spend a lot of our time doing is trying to um, reverse or undo the harm that the criminal justice system has caused our clients who have been trafficked. Both our trafficked and our non-trafficked clients do not have a, a favorable view of law enforcement or the police. In fact, they suffer mightily at the hands of police. We see um, with prostitution policing extensive police misconduct. We see sort of the, the Wild West, right, where anything goes and there's no oversight of policing of prostitution. And what that results in is a distrust of law enforcement. Even putting that aside, though, when my clients are exposed to arrest over and over and over again, the notion that they would then see in the police or in law enforcement a friendly place, a place to go for help, is laughable. I was raped when I was 18 and I was a stripper um, and when I went to the cops they were like they were like what are you wearing it doesn't look like like the way you're dressed doesn't look like you didn't want to have sex I mean I had like bruises and tears and and stuff I mean it was a really traumatic experience trying to report it to the police there have been instances of sexual misconduct by police officers without a doubt um, we had one here in Anchorage that that is just going to happen and you know it's very disturbing we can't abide it sergeant lacy says her goal is to help women in desperate situations the only way she can arresting is not the best answer you know i recognize that right now it's one of the few tools that i have we really don't want to punish them but we want to remove them from that situation and the tools that we have to remove them from that situation are to arrest them and remove them from the trafficker there's not enough um, housing or classes or schooling for these people to make it. And, and, you know, with food stamps or with anything else that we get, it's just it's so hard to survive. Anyone who wants to do anti-trafficking work needs to really roll up their sleeves and start doing anti-poverty work. Because what we're talking about here is a group that's disproportionately affected by poverty, by gender-based violence, by racism by xenophobia, by a lot of things, but we don't want to talk about that stuff. Because you know what, that stuff is actually kind of hard to fix. But if we write a big piece about trafficking and sex slaves and, and the police are going to solve this problem, we feel good about that. That's neatly kind of con you know, condensed and tied up in a bow for us.